A very good Sunday morning to my friends from Brumley Baptist Church. Welcome to Sunday School today as we get ready to dive back into the Old Testament book of Job. We're going to be in chapter 14 today in the first 14 verses, Hope Defined. After Job has been through all the suffering that he has gone through, where can he find hope again? Where can he find something to lean on, something to give him strength? And in turn, where can we find that hope when we may go through difficulties in our own life as well? Grab your Sunday School Quarterly for session two. Grab your Bible, cup of coffee. Let's study God's Word together this morning. been a few times in past athletic contests when I have watched a team that had no chance of winning face a really, really talented team. I think about certain years when Arkansas was really down in football and we traveled to Alabama when they were the number one team. Several years ago, USC, when they were at their height and winning national championships, came to Fayetteville and uh, defeated the Razorbacks 70 to 7, I think. It was very evident very early on. Well, as soon as the team that was kind of the lower tier team knew they were defeated, it, it really got bad. And, and what the key was there was they lost any hope for success. Well, sadly, that sports analogy is true in life. And we've seen people that think they have no hope basically give up, throw in the towel, assume defeat. And when that happens, it can be a really bad thing because when you assume you're going to be defeated, you know, it, it gets really ugly really quick. It is important for us as believers to always maintain a posture and a position of hopefulness. And the reason for that is because we have hope. We have a hope. Because of Jesus, nothing in the Christian life is ever hopeless. Well, Job realized this principle as well. Because of his relationship with God, he realized that he had hope. And because of his hope, he did not give up. Notice what he says. Anyone born of a woman is short of days and full of trouble. This is from chapter 14. He blossoms like a flower, then withers. He flees like a shadow and does not last. Do you really take notice of one like this? Will you bring me into judgment against you? Who can produce something pure from what is impure? No one. Since a person's days are determined by the number of his months depends on you. And since you have set limits, he cannot pass. Look away from him and let him rest so that he can enjoy his day like a hired worker. There is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again, and its shoots will not die. If its roots grow old in the ground and its stump starts to die in the soil, the scent of water makes it thrive and produce twigs like a sapling. But a person dies and fades away, he breathes his last, where is he? As water disappears from a lake and a river becomes parched and dry, so people lie down never to rise again. They will not wake up until the heavens are no more. They will not stir from their sleep. If only you would hide me in Sheol and conceal me until your anger passes. If only you would appoint a time for me and then remember me. When a person dies, will he come back to life? If so, I would wait all the days of my struggle until my relief comes. It is in this passage that Job speaks of the futility and the finality of life and death, that this is what happens. Anyone born of a woman is short of days and full of trouble. Death is an expectation, and trouble is also the expectation. The book of Job is a series of dialogues between Job, his wife, and his three friends. The first cycle of dialogues comes from chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 14, verse 22, near our passage here today. It begins with Job's lament, chapter 3. In chapters four and five, Eliphaz rebukes Job for his response to suffering. Eliphaz says that he's never seen the innocent suffer. Basically, hey, Job, you've done something. You've sinned some way, and God is punishing you. Bildad piles on to what Eliphaz says, beginning in chapter eight or chapter seven and following. And in response to his first dialogue with his friends, Job states that he knows as much about wisdom as they do. Job talks here about the things that he knows 
and the concern that he has over a hope or a lack of hope. So let's look at what he says. Three movements. I'll start number one with questions. Questions. Anyone born of a woman is short of days and full of trouble. He blossoms like a flower, then withers. He flees like a shadow and does not last. Do you really take notice of, of one like this? Will you bring me into judgment against you? Who can produce something pure from what is impure? No one. Since a person's days are determined and the number of his months depends on you, and since you've set limits he cannot pass, look away from him and let him rest so that he can enjoy his day like a hired worker. Job 14, 1 through 14 is the portion of a prayer Job prayed to God that spans from chapter 13, verse 20, all the way to verse 22 of chapter 14. Job is talking to God and asking questions and praying and basically just trying to make sense of all of these things that have happened to him. He's asking, why would God punish Job for the sins of his youth? Why would God consider Job an enemy? What purpose does God have in this suffering? Well, now Job turns to questions about how God treats all of humanity. He uses metaphors to make his point. He says that life is like a flower. The birth of a child is beautiful, like a budding flower. But soon we realize that even though a child has a certain number of days, eventually death comes for all people. The flower withers, it fades away. It disappears from the face of the earth like a shadow that does not last. Life is short and filled with trouble, he says. These observations concerning the brevity of life and being full of suffering led Job to ask three questions. Job needs answers. He's not always going to get those answers, and we have to realize this as well. We may want answers to our suffering. We're not always going to understand the answers to those suffering, and the reason we're not is because we're not God. Even though Job insisted he had done nothing to warrant the agonies he was experiencing, he still realizes he was a sinner. Verse 4, who can produce something pure from what is unpure? No one. So even though he doesn't fully get it, he does get it to some extent to realize that this life is full of trouble and ultimately the culprit is not God, but the culprit is sin. Since God has determined life is short, according to verses 5 and 6, Job appealed to God to let people enjoy the brief number of days they have. Let him enjoy his days like a hired worker. When the work part is over, he can enjoy the rest of his day and relax. Like we get to Friday afternoon, and then we can enjoy the weekends when there's no work to have to be done. There's questions here, deep, nagging questions. And unfortunately, part of our summary of the book of Job is that we don't get full answers to these questions because we're not God, and we can't fully comprehend what's going on. Notice Job moves to despair, beginning in verse 7. There's hope for a tree. If it's cut down, it will sprout again, and if its shoots will not die. If its roots grow old in the ground and its stump starts to die in the soil, the scent of water makes it thrive and produce twigs like a sapling. But a person dies and fades away. He breathes his last. Where is he? As water disappears from a lake and a river becomes parched and dry, so people lie never lie down, never to rise again. They will not wake up until the heavens are no more. They will not stir from their sleep. Verses 7 through 12 contain a con contrast and comparison from nature. Job contrasts the life of a tree with the life of a human being. He says there's more hope for a tree than a person because even if a tree gets cut down, it might live again. It might begin life again with new uh, sprouts. Even from a dry stump, sometimes green tender sprouts come back up from it. The key word in verse 7 are hope and sprout. Even after a tree is cut down, there is hope for it to sprout again. Notice in verse 10, but a person marks a sharp, a sharp contrast between Job's observations of a tree and a human being. It says even if the stump is dying, the scent of water gives it hope, but a man or but a person dies. The irony is in Job's word choice for a person. Instead of using the typical word for ish or Adam, he used the word Gerber, which is associated with the idea of being strong or mighty. The irony is that a strong person could lay low a tree with an ax, yet the tree will survive while the person who is able to cut it down will fade away. The strength of every person will be laid low. Job emphasized this truth with the question, where is he? And Job used the Hebrew word Adam, reminiscent of the first man, Adam, whom God created from the dust. 
Following this contrast, Joe makes a comparison taken from nature. He compares people's deaths with a lake or riverbed that's become dry, like in Death Valley, where in the United States, one of the driest places on planet Earth. From a purely human perspective, Job stated that there's no visible evidence that people can hope for life after death. Thankfully, Job's perspective on matters of life and death included God. The very fact that Job brought these matters to God in prayer demonstrates he had faith, even if his own perspective was limited. Recognizing his helpless state, he brought his concerns to God. Having faith is not the same thing as having answers. Even if Job didn't understand it, and his misunderstanding could have led to despair, the fact that God was part of his equation gives him hope and a reason to continue going forward. If only you would hide me in Sheol and conceal me until your anger passes. If only you would appoint a time for me and then remember me. When a person dies, will he come back to life? If so, I would wait all the days of my struggle until my relief comes. In contrast to the despairing tone of the previous verses, Job recognizes there is hope in God. He asked God to protect him in Sheol. Sheol is the place where people go when they die in the Old Testament. It was their belief. However, instead of Sheol being a permanent place of death, Job saw it as a place to hide temporarily. Could he go there to escape some of the difficulties he was going through in his life right now? But the pinnacle, the top of this prayer is in verse 14. Job asks, when a person dies, will he come back to life? And he tells us that he doesn't know the answer to this question. That if he did, then he would act maybe differently. But because he doesn't yet know, he chooses to live the way he's living right now. Well, the good news for us is we know the answer to this question, friends, through the rest of the revelation of Scripture. When a person dies, will he come back to life? Yes, and yes, and yes. We know they will come back to life. And those who are in Christ will have a hope for all eternity. Suffering in our world leads the believer to consider the greater questions of life. And we need to think about these greater questions, these higher, loftier questions, these deep philosophical naggings. What is our life? What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? If we view death as the final state, that will lead us to despair. But we know that that is not the final state. As Christians, we know of the hope and the promise of someday heaven for each and every one of us. And that is a hope that is beyond all understanding. Next week, we will continue to study the book of Job and look at redemption found from chapter 19, verses 19 through 29. Thank you for joining me for Sunday School this morning. Brumley, have a good and godly day.